uh, most of the ones that we see are, you know, bilateral high astigmatism or things like that, which can lead, you know, if it's really high, but for the most part, those uh, bilateral, amblyopia, bilateral amblyopes, uh, you know, still fuse. Don't develop amblyopia. All right. What is this test that we use in our clinic? And how does it work? Each of those pictures uh, shows the right and left eye with the glasses on a little bit of a different image and together makes this 3D looking image. And then as you go from one to nine, the uh, like arcs difference in the two images that um, the person can perceive um, decreases. Exactly, they get closer together, so they give us less of the feeling. So, you know, if you're looking at this one, this is actually a little different than this, but it's close enough that um, our brain can put it together. So, um, uh, yeah, you're looking at it through these polarized glasses and your brain kind of integrates it into one image. Um, so if you have to, to see all nine of those, what kind of binocular visual acuity do you have to have, do you know? 2025. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I had a faker last week who could only count fingers but could get eight out of nine of these circles. So yeah, it's a good, uh, it's something you can use to test for that. Um, yeah, and that was kind of what I just answered. What else, where else can this be useful? And, and it can be useful in some of those kids who are faking and to kind of reassure you that their vision actually is, is pretty good. So, uh, you know, when I talk about binocular vision with people or strabismus with people and they are looking at that and seeing that their kid can't see those things pop up, does, does a kid who doesn't see those things, do they still have depth perception? Yeah, they can have yes. depth perception because they have like monocular cues and a lot of different other things that can give them decent depth. Exactly. There are lots of people walking around with who don't have, uh, you know, any stereo vision. So um, depth perception is not synonymous with stereopsis. Like you said, monocular cues are also important. Object overlap, relative object size, highlights and shadows and perspective. Like we talked about stereopsis or being able to see those things as a binocular sensation uh, caused by that horizontal disparity that our brain integrates cortically into one. Um, and death, that stereopsis is really only kind of helpful for the first 10 feet or so. After that, you're really mostly relying on monocular cues. So I, I think, you know, I think probably you couldn't be a top baseball player, Roger Federer or something without stereopsis, because I do think it helps you somewhat, but I think, I don't think it holds you back from a, a whole lot in sports otherwise. Um, I think these, you know, you shouldn't discourage kids without, the, you know, any, but not any stereo vision from doing, doing sports. Um, so, you know, your brain, your eyes wire to give you good binocular vision, but you know, which, uh, which retinal fibers cross at the chiasm? Nasal. Exactly. So the nasal ones cross and the temporal ones are stay on the side side there. And they uh, track back to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then back to the, uh, you know, cortical or the visual cortex. In what uh, condition do all the fibers cross? Albinism. Yeah, exactly. How, and how can we diagnose that? VEP. With VEP. Yep. How else can you look for it? Physical exam. Yep. What if the physical exam is kind of unclear? Can't totally tell. The macula and the phobia is underdeveloped. Exactly, yeah. You can try to get an OCT. Some of these kids have nystagmus that make it hard, but some of them it's a pretty fine nystagmus when you're looking at the some of those uh, mild albinisms. It's pretty common, more common than you would think. 
I had a kid the other week that was followed for, yeah, a while for some kind of nystagmus and it looked like albinism to me. But uh, a lot of these kids, I used to send a lot more of them to Creo, but he has inconclusive so much of the time, it's pretty easy to get genetics to do it now. So I just send them to Emily Spoth. As far as visual development, is your vision normal right at birth? No. No. When do we start seeing nystagmus when kids who have like bilateral cataracts? You see that? Four you see months. That we'll say it again. Around four months, I think. Yeah, you can see it about two, two months, two or three months. Yeah, you start to see it. So even kids who, you know, yeah, that's when you start to see it. So yeah, their phobias aren't covered, are, are covered by multiple cell layers at birth, which is, you know, some of those kids that can be hard to tell um, whether they have, they're hypoplastic, right, when they're young, which I think is why the VEP sometimes doesn't work as well. But um, some of them, it's, it's hard to see that foveal dip uh, in a squirmy kid, especially if there is some nystagmus. Um, and I think the phobias are, you know, are a little underdeveloped. And I, I think they take a little longer to develop in some of these kids anyway. Um, but those redistribute in, uh, over the, the first few months and years. What is amblyopia? When your brain doesn't learn to see. Exactly. So it's a brain issue. Families have a hard time understanding why the glasses still don't fix it. And you can kind of go around in circles on that one. But yeah, it's reduced vision that we can't attribute to any other structural abnormality. So it's something that's just brain. Everything else looks pretty normal. What causes amblyopia? There's a lot of different ones. You could have uh, refractive or deprivation or strabismic. Um, those are, I think, the main categories, or maybe some. Oh, um, anisometropic, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Basically, anything that has unequal input to the visual cortical pathways. Exactly. What about a really high astigmatism in both eyes? Yeah, that can be. Oh, that's like anisoconia, right? Anisoconia is more like when you have a different. Um, uh shape of things we see that more in adults like when you do cataract okay. surgery and put them both plano in somebody who's been anisometropic for a long long time or you see that a lot in well yeah it's it's more of a different a different size of image um just a by high high refractive error in both can make it so you know some of these kids like we can never correct them to 2020 just because they didn't wear their glasses when they were young when they're like four and five diopters of uh, astigmatism so yeah um strabismus and, and anims of metropia are the big ones and those are the ones that um uh we are really looking for with those vision screeners um which kind of those is is harder to treat Strabismus is harder. Yeah, exactly. So anisometropia, often if you put the kids in glasses, it will just solve the problem uh, uh, totally. Um, whereas strabismus, you'd usually have to do some kind of patching and things because anisometropia, yeah, when you put the glasses on, you're kind of correcting them all the time. Strabismus, you still, you know, some of them are still manifest, even uh, you have to do some kind of patching or some kind of therapy. So it, it's always harder to treat the strabismic. And then when they have a mix on top, that makes it even harder when they're strabismic and have an anisometropic uh, refractive error. Um, and then high bilateral refractive error. So really high minuses, really high pluses, or just, um, uh, um, or high astigmatism. So when do you give glasses to kids? This is, uh, you know, a, we all have differences of opinion, even among the, the five of us about when to give glasses. And oftentimes I'll take kids out of glasses that optoms put them in. But, um, uh, you know, this is a little diagram that's put together by the AAO. Um, 
but in general, little kids can tolerate a you know little little less than a year can tolerate a fair amount of refractive error, um, you know, without it causing bilateral amblyopia. Um, usually, and even if they if they do have some of those high errors, if you put them in glasses later and wait a little while, it's pretty easy to treat. So I sit on a lot of these refractive errors. I mean, less than a year, even if they have up to three three and a half or of diopters of astigmatism, I won't put them in glasses. Um, even if they do have a little bit of amblyopia from not being able to see things clearly enough, if you wait a year or two, it's usually pretty easy to treat. Um, you know, even two or three year olds and a minus three, they don't think you need to give those. Um, hyperopia, I tolerate a lot more than that. Um, usually if they're straight, um, you know, there is some thought that if you treat these kids with hyperopia, um, then they aren't accommodating as much and that that's not going to drive eye growth as much. Um, uh, yeah, and these are the, these are what they recommend. They kind of put as their sets numbers on their, um, vision screeners, but I find these to be pretty different, um, and sometimes much less than this, but like, yeah, these one-year-olds who come in with two diopters of astigmatism, so many kids have that. And I think that there's a thought that maybe if you put them in them and put them in the glasses, maybe they won't naturally outgrow it. So, but like a year old, they don't, you don't even recommend putting glasses until there's two and a half diopters of anisometropia. So, um, yeah, a lot of these kids, we may be catching a lot of these things that are transitory and maybe we don't want to mess with, but um, a lot of times optometrists will put kids in glasses that I will take them out of that, you know, don't seem to be necessary. Um, so amblyopia is caused by, you know, optical defocus, uh, you know, on one of the maculas or both of the maculas. It can be caused by anisometropia which has a later onset than a critical period than strabismic amblyopia, just saying, that's just saying that, you know, it's easier to treat, you have a longer window there. Um, this says, you know, you don't even develop any kind of as astigmatic amblyopia until during the first year and may not develop until age three. I sit on astigmatisms of three, 350, maybe even four, you know, in those early years of life. Um, Strabismus is, you know, you actually have a foveal disparity where the where the foveas are not lined up. They're not looking at the same thing. Um, also uh, has some optical defocus because there's, you know, not focused on those foveas. Um, but this critical period's younger, um, so it's, you know, uh, this is why we operate early for strabismus is trying to prevent that amblyopia, trying to prevent that uh, loss of fusion. So why do kids develop it? Um, so they're largely trying to avoid diplopia, especially with strabismus, right? They're, they're seeing too big adaptation of the brain to um, uh, get rid of a second image. Um, um, and it can be facultative, um, uh, suppression can be facultative, meaning you can come and go like intermittent exotropia. They're not always suppressing, but it can, you know, when they do go exotropic, then they start depressing, depressing, sorry. Um, treating it, we like to treat it with put them in, in glasses, treating with patching and atropine and, 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 you know, trying to align their visual axes with surgery if we need to for those strabismic amblyopia. What about adults who are suppressing? How do we treat them? In general, we don't like to stop them from suppressing uh, because if we do, you know, you're not going to get back binocularity usually, you know, in these people who are suppressing. And sometimes when you start mess with, messing with it, you can get something that you, you can't get rid of. So um, you have to be, you know, really careful with, with some of these um, people, adults with strabismus, especially when they have anomalous retinal correspondence and they're suppressing one eye. Um, you know, sometimes they used to do some therapies to try to get them to unsuppress it and then they, they can't make it go away again. So, um, uh, you gotta be pretty careful with those adults with the uh, history of childhood strabismus. Um, what is anomalous retinal correspondence? The um, center of the vision in one eye, like 
is uh, like offset from where you'd expect the fovea to be. So the eyes are not aligned, but the uh, images are. Exactly, you have kind of a, you know, an anomalous correspondence between the two eyes where the fovea in one eye um, kind of makes a relationship with a peripheral element, element in the other eye. Um, so it's an adaptation to have some kind of degree of binocularity. Um, uh, uh, how would this look in, in a kid in clinic or an adult? They could have um, apparent strabismus, but um, actually be fusing. Yeah, exactly. So it's when they're kind of um, Krinsky and their alternate prism doesn't match up, what they're kind of seeing and what you measure are not always the same. What's this test? Worth four dot. Yeah. So what, if you close your left eye, what do you see? What? You see just the red. Yeah, so you see two reds. If you close your right eye, what do you see? Just the green. Yeah. So what does it mean when you see five? It means you're misaligned, but not suppressing. Exactly. So you're, you're either, sometimes it can be that they're alternating between the two, like if they, it can be that they're like, they can be suppressed. Sometimes they'll answer that they see five, but they're really going back and forth. But if they really see five all the time, yes, it means that they're they're diplopic. And Dr. Young, when yeah. you for the uh, anomalous retinal correspondence, I always get kind of confused. It's different than angle kappa because angle kappa is when the fovea is actually in a different anatomical place. Exactly. So uh, angle kappa, their phobias are actually looking at the same thing. They're actually kind of lined up. Um, but, you know, their phobia can be dragged a little bit further. Like albino kids are always positive angle kappa. Kids with ROP can be positive angle kappa. Some people just are. There's just more space between their nerve and their, and their retina. So, um, yeah, so like a... They're actually, even though they're, I mean, I guess, did I have a good image back here? If I ever have a good, where they're looking at the same thing. No, um, like if you're, and I'm a horrible artist, but, and I don't know, these lights keep going off. Um, So like, yeah, so like an image, I don't even know if you can see, you can see here that like, if you're looking at the same image, there's a lot of space there between your macula and your fovea, or sorry, your fovea and your nerve, but they're still lined up looking at the same image. Whereas if you have like a, um, yeah, and if they're- Less distance. Yeah, and they should actually be, and I'm not a good dry, and good, but the eyes will kind of be pointed out a little bit to get those maculas to, to line up here but they're actually looking with the same part of their macula whereas you have anomalous it's going to be like that is actually lined up here right mm -hmm. so um uh but when you do cover on cover there's not going to be any movement but when you look at them um uh or uh, that, uh, that yeah, for anomalous retinal correspondence yeah there's not going to be much movement, but it's, or or it's not going to line up with what you what your Krimsky is. It's why it's important, like in some in people who have had many strabismus surgeries or things like that, to when do a cover on cover, um, and then also do a Krimsky to make sure it's the same. Gotcha. Like I've got one girl that's um, if you shine a light at her eyes, she's clearly it looks like she's exotropic and one eye's looking at the wall. But then when you have her look at the look at the chart and do cover on cover her eyes are actually coming she actually has an esophoria so um 
just the what she's using for phobia or what her eyes are lining up you know and she doesn't have good vision in either eye and usually these people don't you know often won't um but they can they can they can have an okay vision too but um yeah the short answer to that is yes with the positive angle cap of their phobias are, are are lined up whereas with an anomalous retinal correspondence it's a phobia in one eye and, and something that that's kind of corresponding as a phobia in the other eye kind of like a paraphobia or something that they're using but it's not actually the phobia got it and Dr. Young, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember being, I think I was in clinic with you and you said that like positive angle cap is far, 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 far more common than actual anomalous retinal correspondence, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people like, I don't know, my husband always is on TV. Like, is that person exotropic? <laughs> like a lot of people just kind of have a little look of exotropia, especially when they're looking off to the side or things, but they aren't truly exotropic um you know it's just that they're how they're where their fovea is there's just you know a few microns more distance between their fovea and their optic nerve and just to clarify um when you're examining the, the patient like by crimsky crimsky and, and uh alternate cover those two conditions should look pretty much the same and you basically have to look at the macro to be like to decide which of the two it is yeah yeah or if they're i mean they should be pretty much the same if they're not you got some kind of an issue and you have to be careful about it because if you just operate for that a you know to line up what you think the phobia is um that they may not like it if you actually line up their phobia sometimes like in an anomalous retinal correspondence what they're using they kind of like um like in an adult what they're using to correspond with their phobia in one eye and the other eye is, is kind of where they like to be. And sometimes if you put their phobias together, they won't like it just because their brain is not biphobial. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I have one kid that is an albino that um, uh, he's an ocular albino and he came in with like a six, you know, 50 XT and um, I uh, did surgery on him and he was still a little bit XT, but had diplopias that like all the, you know, that was, that lasted for about six months and then finally went away. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, I couldn't, it was weird. I couldn't get, even when I put his eye back, he'd tell me he still had diplopia, still had diplopia. But if I, I just sat on it for a while, but yeah, that's, uh, he had some kind of binocular problem and he was still exotropic like he should have still he's not totally binocular but i would have thought he would still be within some kind of a suppression scotoma but um just kind of weird some of those kids have weird adaptations that you can't totally figure out he was also like 15 at the time so it wasn't like he could rewire or, or things but it did finally go away um we talked about that oh we're back here sorry We kind of talked oh so uh mono fixation syndrome is a condition where you have a central scotoma and peripheral fusion um these are people who have just you know sometimes they'll come in with just a little amblyopia but you don't even really see much strabismus at all and you can't and you dilate them and they don't have much refractive error in either eye um it can also be a good outcome of uh um uh of strabismus surgery for somebody with like congenital esotropia. Um, that's what it says there on the bottom. Um, these people can have amblyopia, you know, because they have just a tiny, a small misalignment. Um, they have some stereo, but reduced stereo. Um, and they may or may not have a little man manifest deviation. So, um, how would you test for this? What do these people look like on for worth four dot? So you do a worth uh, far away where the angle between the two eyes is pretty small. And then you do a worth up close where you get outside of their scotoma. Yeah, and what do you see on those tests? So they'll only see like whatever eye they're suppressing uh, at distance. So we'll see like two dots or, you know, three green. And then up close, um, they'll be both. Correct, yeah. So they fuse it up close. Um, 
Anyone know? They used to do these kinds of tests on the board. Anyone know what this is? <laughs> Amblyoscope. Exactly. So uh, it's something that you can use to kind of really, uh, it can be really helpful to look at big cyclo deviations. So people with a lot of torsion, they can really dial it in and see if they can fuse stuff together to figure out um, uh, exactly what their deviation is um, or, you know, subjectively. Um, and it, it can be helpful, like in people with a lot of torsion who, no matter what kind of prism you put up, they still can't fuse things because they've got so much torsion, it can help to kind of uh, figure that out. Um, they can also use it to try to increase your fusional amplitudes. Um, sometimes that can be a problem if you start unmasking suppression though, or undoing suppression. In clinic though, how do we usually measure torsion? Double Maddox rod. Exactly. Or those Bagolini lenses. They took a lot of this stuff out of your PEDS book, which is good because <laughs> they had used to have a lot of superfluous information. But um, yeah, so you put these, ra these rods on there, you have um, uh, them turn the dials and then you kind of read them. And what they put them as is what you read them as. So this red one here would be X cyclotorted because they've twisted it out that way. What kinds of things do we see that cause torsion? Who do we come in complaining of torsion? What's the big one in the adults that causes torsion? Fourth nerve. Yeah, exactly. So traumatic fourth nerves, um, sometimes congenital fourth nerves that start unmasking later. Looking at this guy, what's his diagnosis? Is it a right cranial nerve for? Exactly, exactly. So, so if he has um, limited depression um, of his, of the right eye. Correct. And it's, it's oh, inferior oblique is overacting. So in that upper right one, that's, you know, he's overacting an adduction of that, of his right eye. You can also tell that he's got some esotropia and down gaze. Sometimes they have a little exotro, you know, they have a, you know, have a V pattern usually. Mm -hmm. And if they have bilateral, it can be much worse. So yeah, they can have a V pattern esotropia. Um, but yeah, if you look at that right eye, looking to the, his right, it looks pretty normal. When he starts looking to his left, that right eye, you know, starts twisting up um, and much more in the up and um, left gaze. But yeah, and then he doesn't depress as well. Which of the following rules out a diagnosis of monofixation? Peripheral fusion. They have peripheral fusion in monofixation. They do they have it. Yep. Do they have bimacular fusion? No. No. Do you see uh, two lights at a distance? Yes. Yeah, they do see that. Um, and what about 60 arc seconds of stereo? They do not. No. No. Um, yeah, they do not have that much stereo. They usually have much worse stereo than that. Why might you patch a kid with optic nerve hypoplasia? Because most of their vision loss is gonna be from the hypoplasia, right? Well, you still might be able to uh, improve their vision a little bit in the the like the nerve, the eye with the hypoplasia. Um, yeah. Using it to be used more. 
so they may have, you know, because of the hypoplasia, they don't see as well, right? And so then they may get some strabismus and then they may lose a little bit of additional vision from amblyopia. So you're trying to see if you can get their vision any better from any overlying amblyopia on top of optic nerve hypoplasia. Sometimes you can't. I mean, I, some of these kids, every time you patch them, they just, you know, go to sleep, just telling you they get no vision at all out of that eye. So sometimes you can't, but I think it's always worth a try to see if you can, but that's why we patch them is from any additional vision they might lose from amblyopia. So this is a case, a six month old girl with the esotropy of 50. Um, she has a cyclopedic refraction of one, 1 1.5 diopters. Would you give glasses to that kid? No, that would be expected for the age range. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give glasses to that kid. Um, I mean, you could, but I don't, it's not gonna fix that ET of 50. Um, this is not, you know, uh, 150, uh, you give glasses when they have more of an accommodative component and then a six month old with that big of an ET looks more like a congenital esotropia. So in general, no, you wouldn't give glasses for that. I mean, if they had a higher one, you could try it and see, it probably won't change it much, but it's always worth trying. Yeah, if they had four or five, yeah, I would. If they had three, maybe. But for 150, I don't think so. I'd just do the surgery. And if they're still crossing a little bit after, you could give that to get rid of the last residual. But 150 is not usually going to correct an ET of 50, especially in a six-month-old. Um, mm -hmm. What else might you see on exam in a kid with congenital esotropia? What else are you looking for? The alternating. Yeah, it's alternating. So when, because they're alternating, are they usually amblyopic or not? Not, not, not. You can sometimes create amblyopia because then you do surgery and you leave them with a little ET and those kids are more likely to be amblyopic. But when they have a big angle like that, they usually use one eye to fixate one way and the other eye to fixate the other way. So no, they're not usually amblyopic. But what else do you see on exam? Sometimes it doesn't come up till later though. Late nystagmus and DVD. DVD, yep. Yeah. Sometimes those don't come up until a little later, but what else is associated with those two things? Like a V pattern? A V pattern and, yep. What causes that V pattern? Uh, inferior oblique. Exactly. Over action. So, exactly. Wait. Okay. <laughs> so you're gonna operate on this ET of 50 and do a BMR. Um, you just want to know, should you also operate on those obliques at the same time? Is there any oblique overaction? Um, because if you do a BMR and then start to realize that you missed the, the obliques, you know, you don't want to have to go back. If you, if they're already overacting, you should recess them now at the time. Um, when would you operate? There's some, there's some discussion about this. I think Griffin sits on these sometimes. I think where he trained, he said they sometimes like to wait until they're a year old. But I, at the six month, you know, if they come in at three, I'll usually watch them until they're about five or six months. But I'd operate now because they've got a 50 ET. They're never going to, that's not consistent with binocularity. Um, I just think the earlier, the better on that. Sometimes it can get better and, and go away. You know, some of these ETs can be transient, but usually when they're up to 50, they're not. Um, what kind of outcome would you expect? Do these kids usually get binocularity back? Good binocularity, good stereo vision? Yes. They usually don't get great stereo, but they can. Even if you just get like a mono fixation and, and grow stereo, you're pretty happy here. But um, so it, it's hard to get binocularity in these guys. I mean, good stereo in these guys. You can get binocularity, but it's hard to get good stereo back in, the, in these kids who are born with congenital ET, but that's what you're hoping for, which is why I would operate sooner on this kiddo. And that's what you're saying, Dr. Young, is that you would operate to hopefully to restore, uh, restore binocularity, not necessarily um, for amblyopia because they are, Correct. are not amblyopic. Correct. They're usually not amblyopic. They're much more likely to be amblyopic after you operate because then you leave them usually with a small tropia or often do. Um, you're operating more to get binocularity than stereo. Gotcha. And then do you just try to, you know, have that with the residual um, ET with like prism and 
for glasses. I don't usually do prism. Um, a lot of these kids, some of these kids are, you know, straight on for a while and sometimes slowly they drift a little exotropic, whether that's because the eye grows or, or, you know, the muscle slips back a little more or, or what, but sometimes, you know, that you could do get a consecutive exotropia later, even, even if they're pretty close to straight for many years, sometimes they still drift that way. Um, their brains just aren't as good at holding, uh, holding things as straight, but, um, yeah, you're, you're just trying to, you're trying to get some amount of binocularity. The, what outcome you would expect that the, I mean, I'm just saying uh, the answer to that question is, yeah, even if you're going to get a monofixation syndrome, that's some kind of fusion and it's better than nothing. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it's better to operate early and try to get something, some amount of binocularity to, that will keep them straight in the long run. Gotcha. Thank you. Is the argument to not to like wait till a year or so, would that be so that you decrease the risk of like creating amblyopia? I, I don't know what the total argument is. I know some people argue that a lot of these go away or some of them go away. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the strabismus can be transient in this age group. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I was kind of surprised when he came here and said that that's what they do at Indiana often. So, um, I think the but usually the big argument is that it can be transitory. But yeah, I mean, yes, another argument would be that yeah, they, they aren't usually amblyopic. Um, okay. I just feel like that clock is ticking on binocularity, but I guess they they don't. Some people don't have that same opinion. So um, a two year old girl comes in with this prescription. What else would you like to know? That's what her failed screening. Would you give glasses to that kid? Is she straight? Is she straight? Exactly. If she's crossing, yeah, for sure I would. If she's not crossing, no, I wouldn't. You can also just look at their retinoscopy before you dilate them and see if they're focusing all three diopters. But usually a two-year-old with three diopters will, will be focusing. So do they neutralize it near with, with the retinoscopy? Um, usually a three, they will. It starts to be more of a question when kids have like six, seven, something like that. We kind of talked about this. Why is it important to get Krimsky and alternate prism color testing in adults? Because yeah, because they ha can have ARC or anomalous retinal correspondence or some kind of um, kind of funky fusional thing. I had a lady last week who had a congenital fourth nerve palsy, and you would do a cover, you know, alternate prism cover, and she would go up to sixteen. But then when you give her sixteen, she'd tell you she could see two screens and only two screens, like they were so far apart. So she had something fusional uh, that she only liked about four diopters of prism, um, but um, she really could build up to about 16. Adults are just harder because they usually have some amount of binocularity, whereas kids often don't, or they're remold after you do surgery. They're much more forgiving. So you just have to be a lot more careful in adults. This was a patient that I had who came to see me from Amy Lynn. So a 35 year old comes in for a LASIK eval. He's got a cyclopedic refraction that looks kind of like that. Now he's getting to be 35 and he can't focus that 150 up close and he wants to do a clear lens exchange. Um, but he feels like he gets double with his new glasses. Um, just these people with uh, anisometropia and hyperopia and a little ET can be kind of tricky. So the teaching point, the, this guy, when I gave him his full prescription, he was diplopic. So if, if she had done surgery or clear lens exchange to make him Plano in both eyes, he would have been really unhappy because, um, uh, because that left eye, he, he liked to not wear glasses and let that left eye be blurry and then he could suppress it. But when you corrected his vision in that eye, he really didn't like it. And he'd just been for years and years that way. And his vision was actually pretty good corrected like 2025. 20, but um, so I think she ended up just doing an exchange on his right eye. Um, but some of these people, yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. So if it doesn't totally make sense to you, um, it's often good to send them to business people to kind of take a look. That, this one was kind of a weird one, but I think if she had corrected him plain on both eyes, he would have been unhappy. So he, he, he's, he's happily suppressing, but if right now, because he's keeping that left eye blurred, but if you unblur it, 
he may not be so happy. Do you think it's possible that he could have been unhappy in the short term and then like gotten uh, the ability to fuse because it's so small? Or do you think it's like, man, he, because you know how they say like adults have a little plasticity, they can sort of adapt. Or I think he would have just been totally. It's angry. a good question. It's a good question. He may have been uh, like that late. And I tried to have this discussion with Dr. Hoffman uh, recently, like that lady that I have that actually is a 16. Like, I think if you operate for the 16, she'll be miserable for a while. But I feel like some of her problem is just a fusional problem. And she probably would settle into it because I actually she had stereo. So I think her phobias do like to be lined up, but it's some kind of a thing. So I think she would have been miserable for a while but actually would have kind of probably slowly gone into it over time this guy i'm not so sure but it, it is a good question I, if they could have it's like that kid i had who had double vision for six months and then it finally went away um if you actually kind of make him better maybe but maybe not i i don't know that he would have if he would have been able to because i think he's just totally turning it off when it's blurred but when you make it clear he has a hard time turning it off and I don't know if that would have gotten better with time or if he would have actually started to kind of rewire. It's a good question. Yeah, it makes sense, especially in this population who's coming in wanting a good result. I would. Yeah, yeah exactly. Stay, stay clear. Did, did he have any stereo, this guy? Uh, uh, I can't remember that. I bet he did not because I, I think he was kind of, he's at, he was like, I think he was suppressing and blurred up close i think he was mostly always suppressing that left eye i think he's kind of like a mono fixation and he's in that suppression scotoma but start, you know when you started to make his vision more clear he like pulled out that et a little bit and got out of his suppression scotoma so i can't remember if he had stereo i was trying to remember what his name was because i was going to look up his chart i was just pulling this from my memory and i can't remember his name either but my guess is no he didn't have stereo yes he could he clearly had an et uh, so if, if he had stereo it would have been a very like uh reduced stereo all right the other part of my lecture is um into your segment. And while you're pulling that up, I was just going to tell the junior residents that at AUPO, the AAO, like AAO basically did this like OCAP kind of update. And they said that monofixation syndrome is one of the most missed topics on OCAP. So glad that we're covering it here. <laughs> yeah, they like to test on peds because Nobody likes to think about those things. <laughs> um, what's the diameter of a newborn's cornea? Nine point five to ten point five. Exactly. It gets to adult size by about age two, but it's usually just a little bit, a little bit smaller. Um, what's our diagnosis for kids with enlarged corneas? Glaucoma. Oh. Yeah, megalocornea, but the big one is glaucoma. That's the one you're worried about. Um, I have never seen this, but um, it's an X-linked dis recessive disorder, megalophthalmos. They have an increased risk of glaucoma. It's not progressive. It's kind of a hard picture to read, but anybody have any idea what this is? Keratoglobus. Yeah, exactly. Where do we see that in? Like what other disorder? Yeah, or what can it be associated with? Uh, is it like ehlers danlos Yeah, exactly. So keratoglobus is when the entire cornea is thin. We have a really deep anterior chamber. What do we worry about in these guys? Perforation. Yes. So I saw my saddest case in residency of a guy with this. He was an attorney in San Francisco. When he was a kid, he had been hit in one eye with a baseball, so he was monocular. And then his wife rolled over and elbowed him in bed one night and opened his globe. And he went from being a very functioning attorney to lights up, you know, blind. It was really oh my god. Um, but yeah, uh, the big it can be associated with Ehlers Danlos, but just eye protection is the big thing in these guys and uh, preventing uh, open globe. 
What disorder might you encounter in a Down syndrome patient who rubs her eyes? Keratoconus. Yeah, exactly. Um, keratoconus is a uh, progressive thinning and bulging of the paracentral or central cornea, often presents and progresses during adolescence, can be associated with Down syndrome. In kids, I usually do, you just start seeing like a rapidly progressive, often um, astigmatism in teenage years. Um, can treat them with RGPs, corneal transplants. Um, what causes high drops in these patients? What's the anatomic thing that happens that causes it? You rupture decimase. Great, yep. Um, yeah, and then they come in with eyes like this. But yeah, kids with Down syndrome certainly get it more commonly. Um, it can be you know, painful, look like this, a little difficult to treat. Microcornea we see sometimes can be associated with other problems. Um, big thing in these kids is just trying to get them appropriate refractive correction, treat associated amblyopia. What disorder is this? Is that sclerocornea? Yeah, exactly. Um, these kids, um, it's non-progressive. They have a central uh, cornea that's clearer, which is in contrast to Peter's anomaly. Um, uh, sometimes they don't look, you know, quite as, I have one kid that, uh, yeah, doesn't look quite as bad as this. Um, uh, can be sporadic or hereditary, off, you know, usually bilateral. R can't really treat them with a corneal transplant because they'll just uh, erode again or uh, vascularize again. Usually just kind of try to treat their amblyopia. What is this disorder? Peters. Yeah, exactly. What does it look like underneath? Uh, there's no endothelium, but there's also adhesions to either the lens or the uh, iris. Yeah. How do they progress with time usually? Stay the same, get worse, get better. I'm not actually right. sure someone has to help me out here. <laughs> they usually kind of clear over time. They get more clear, which is kind of funny. Um, how do we treat these guys? Can do a PK. You can do a PK. Some people also just cut a hole out of the iris and make an iridectomy that's so it's bigger. Um, hmm. uh, can also just, you know, dilate, try to dilate the pupil around it to get good vision. Um, I've seen a few of these that are kind of like very mild, um, where the, mm, it's just, can, can you see if I move my mouse here? or no? Yes. Oh yeah, you can't see that. Yeah, so they'll be just like a little bit here and they're often infranasal, um, just like colobomas, but they uh, will just have a little bit of haze here. Um, so not quite a, a, as bad up here. And they often are very, um, they're often asymmetric, you know, unilateral, and they're often very anisometropic. So they can be like very, I've got several where they're like plus five in one eye and plus nothing in the other eye. Um, but you can actually end up getting pretty good vision because usually you get them in refractive correction early because they come in because they have this, you know, some haze on their cornea. So I have some with pretty good vision actually. Um, but yeah, some people will do optical iridectomies, but the big thing is that, yeah, they kind of clear, they get a little bit more clear over time. What do we see here? Jeremiah. Yeah. What do we see it in? Golden heart. Golden heart. Exactly. What happens when you take it off? <laughs> or what do you usually what do you usually see when you dilate these people? When you re refract them. They usually have a bunch of astigmatism and it's usually kind of like that, like uh uh like this one would be at like 60 or something or like 70. They'll kind of just be 
almost parallel to that, but when they take it off, it often does nothing to the astigmatism, but they sure look a heck of a lot better. So um, uh, yeah, and usually cornea doesn't like to do it until they're a little bit older, like school age, just because there's more cornea to deal with. But um, sometimes they'll do a, like a lamellar um, graft in there. Sometimes they'll just shave it off. Um, but I've seen some really nice things done with them, but it doesn't usually change the refraction. So there's not a whole lot of visual benefit to doing it early. Um, you know, and the cosmetic benefit isn't usually until they're a little later anyway, just because kids don't care what kids look like until they're, they've done some studies looking at kids and it's like five years old that they start realizing that other kids have crossed eyes and things like that. So um, in general, yes, we just wait on these. Um, we kind of already went over all that. What do you suspect here? Kid who comes in with a cornea looking like that. Lots of little crystals in it. Cystosis. Yeah, exactly. I have a couple of these kids. Um, and they're all on um, that's these drops that you're supposed to use six times a day, which is <laughs> not so possible in little kids. But um, they say they get photophobia, but for the kids I've seen, I do not think they get any photophobia. Um, the big thing is kind of renal failure. All the kids I've seen have come in already with it um, diagnosed. Um, but the, these drops, they have to get them and keep them in their fridge and use them like six times a day and um sometimes they still progress but i've got at least yeah a couple little guys with this sometimes they smell funny because they're on other draw other medications or something like the people smell interesting um what's the diagnosis here herbs yeah exactly um you guys probably see this a lot on call um, we don't like to put steroids on it. We don't see this so much in kids. They usually don't come in with dendrites. They usually, um, come in the stromal disease, but, uh, most resolve on their own. Some people put them on antivirals. What do you guys do here these days? Just oral antiviral. You do orals. Yeah. Do you debride them at all or no? I don't. I've never seen that though. No, I haven't seen that. What we see more commonly is kit is is stromal keratitis. So these are kids who I had one once that was a <laughs> orbital cellulitis that didn't go away for six weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's not orbital cellulitis. <laughs> Uh, but it's usually pretty easy to tell right when you put a, um, you know, you often can't get these kids to a slit lamp, um, you know, especially in their acute phase, you, you know, they're usually little scared. But if you throw up a retinoscope, you can see that they're, you know, they don't have a bright reflex, that there's something funny going on there. Um, um, they can be pretty aggressively get neovascularization, but it can also go away pretty, pretty nicely as well. Um, the big thing is putting these kids on acyclovir for a while to try to prevent it recurrences. Um, but any kid who comes in with um, especially unilateral painful eye or eye that they won't open, it's always something you need to think about, especially in kids with any kind of a immune. I've got one girl with pretty bad disease like this and she's got some kind of immune problem so yeah any kind of a kid with kind of immune disease or anyone that's on chemo or any kind of immunosuppressants you want to think about uh herpes um i usually do somewhere in like this range and divide it tid for the acute phase and then go down to bid for maintenance for six months or a year they often come back the big thing is they often get some funky astigmatism afterwards um, as a result of the scarring or just the changes in the cornea um i've got one kid that's got like four diopters of against the rule still in, in the in the eye that and you know got nothing in the other eye but he had this when he was like two so he had him in glasses right away and his vision's 2025. So they can get a lot of astigmatism. Um, so it's just important that post uh, post infection or whatever you just have somebody retinoscope them to make sure you're you're figuring out what that is. I have one girl with this who 
also has a bunch of astigmatism, has a lot of central clouding. Her best corrective vision is about 2040, 2030 now in that eye. And then she, I've been following her for 10 years and she started to get an intermittent exotropia like last year, like nine years in, which is just weird, but um, can happen. She doesn't ever like to wear her glasses that correct that sill. So she, I think she sits at like 2080, 2000. Um, I'm not worried about amblyopia, but it probably in some way contributed to now the fact that she's got an intermittent exotropia. So what is this? Hi guys. Staff marginal. Yeah, or vernal. It's vernal, yeah. What are those white dots called? Limbal follicles? They are limbal follicles, but. Corner trunk. Yeah, exactly. And what are they? What kind of cells are they? Epithelial. Yeah, they're eosinophils. So it's collections of eosinophils. They look pretty robust like this, but they go right away with a little bit of steroids. So they, they're pretty easy to treat um, right away, but getting them to stay away is always hard because they, you know, you don't want to stay on steroids for a long period of time and they really need to be on some kind of maintenance uh, therapy. This kind of um, vernal is much more common in Af African-American kids. Um, um, males, more than females, usually resolves by puberty. Um, yeah, it's more common with these horner tranis dots in, in African-Americans. Whereas this you see more in the in the Caucasian kids where they get those really robust um, uh, um, you know things uh, under their uh, when you flip their lid um, they can rub on their these these um, I don't you don't want to call them I don't think they call them GPC right what do they call those. I can't remember, just those huge giant, those huge papilla under their lids. Um, they can rub on their cornea and cause some um, haze and drop their vision a little bit. Um, I have seen some people who, some cornea guys that will inject their upper lid with steroid. Um, but the big thing is to get them on Claritin, Zyrtec. I usually put them on Patanol and then just try, you know, use them steroids for the acute phase, but it's hard because people don't like to, kids don't like to stay on that Patanol and the steroids usually work a whole lot better, um, but can just be kind of a chronic relapsing remitting disease till they, you know, till they outgrow it. Um, and it sometimes can't drop their vision. They can get some ptosis in the eye that that's worse. And it's often, you know, you know, often like bilateral, but much worse in one eye than the other. And I don't really know why that is, but um, yeah, it could be tri tricky to treat that you see these kids over and over and over again. What's this? We see these pretty commonly. In kids. Flictenule. Yeah, exactly. So um, these are flictenules. They're a white thing. They often have, you know, pretty ro robust vessels going right up to it and a day or two of steroids will get rid of it. Um, I don't know why you can't see my notes here, but uh, yeah, usually just a short little course of, I usually just do Maxitrol because it's cheaper than Tobradex, but um, it's a type four hypersensitivity reaction for the boards. They always worry about tuberculosis in these people. Um, which I've never seen, but it's just because kids have really sensitive immune systems, but they just have this white dot that sometimes is at the limbus, isn't always at the limbus, can be back from the limbus a little bit, but uh, if you just put a little steroid on it, it will go away really pretty quickly, but um, we see these pretty, pretty commonly. What's this line called? By this line, I mean this one here. Posterior embryotoxin? Yeah, exactly. So um, it's a thickening and displacement of Schwalbe's line. About 15% of normal individuals have it. Can also be associated with Axenfeld's anomaly, which is um, these, you know, little projections up here to the scleral spur. Um, uh, can be associated with, uh, you know, some of these mutations. Some of them, 50% can develop glaucoma uh, inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Um, can be associated with Riger's anomaly here. My slides 
didn't turn out so well. Um, this is Riger syndrome, the anomaly with some systemic abnormalities and this fa this facial uh, appearance. I haven't seen too many of these kids. Doesn't seem too prevalent in this genetic pool here. What do you see here on exam? Aniridia. Yeah, exactly. So in kids without with the aniridia and you're trying to get a glasses prescription, would you still dilate, would you still cycloplegium? Yeah, because they still have some iris. Exactly. And they still accommodate. They can still usually, you know, even though they don't have an iris or they might not have an iris, they can still usually, you know, accommodate. And what we're doing when we usually, the biggest reason we dilate kids is so they cannot focus. They cannot accommodate so we can figure out what their glasses prescription is. So these kids still accommodate. So yes. Um, it's kind of funny. People forget that. I had somebody that HeartNet was following a few months ago that she put on atropine for dilation. It's like, no, you, <laughs> that's cycloplegism. It does more, you know, so it's, that's going to make their amblyopia worse. But yeah, the bigger reason we dilate people is to cycloplegium. Um, aniridia, you know, these, these kids have phobial hypoplasia, which is the cause of their vision loss. They have pendular nystagmus. They can't have corneal panis due to, you know, stem cell deficiency. I haven't seen that much in kids. I think that gets worse as they get a little bit older. They can have some non-progressive cataracts, uh, optic nerve hypoplasia, and they can have, you know, much more likely to have glaucoma. So every time we see them, we check their pressure. But the big thing we're worried about in these kids is Somebody comes into you with what? Wager. Yeah, exactly. So, so kid comes into you with aniridia, you got to be worried about um, uh, this, yeah, Wilms tumor, why they have it. If it's hereditary, you know, and it's associated with the PAC-6, we don't have to worry about it. But if it's a new sporadic case, um, you've got to make sure you get them worked up for this. And uh, some of these kids need uh, repeat ultrasounds to look for, for Wilms tumor. Um, treating these kids, they like tinted glasses. Just make sure you correct their refraction. Sometimes they have a fair amount of sill. Um, limb, cell, limb stem cell transplant. Sometimes if that um, panis starts overgrowing and affecting their vision too much, watch for glaucoma and refer them to low vision services. Why do you always see colobomas infranasally? That's where embryologically it fuses last. Exactly. Um, uh, so these can involve the ciliary body, choroid, retina, optic nerve, depending on how much they involve, you know, their vision is, uh, corresponds with that. Um, uh, they can be surgically repaired and some people, they are a little bit more light sensitive in those eyes. Um, I have seen, you know, these kids often can have, you know, even though, even when their pupils pulled pretty low down, um, they can still have pretty good vision. Um, in general, like pupillary anomalies often don't cause vision problems. I have one kid whose pupils pulled way up and she's got 20, 20 vision. So they, the kids can use those uh, eccentric pupils, especially when they're born with them, you know, in these kilobomas, sometimes even when the top is of their, iris is pulled down, you know, to midline or lower, oftentimes they still have pretty good vision. So I don't worry so much about that. Um, the bigger issue is how much, you know, how extensive is a coloboma. What's your biggest concern in this patient? First of all, what are those? Yeah. And so where, what do we see those in? In neurofibromatosis. Exactly. And what do kids with neurofibromatosis get? That we were even optically almost exactly. Um, so, um, yeah, geez, I screwed up some of these slides pretty bad. Um, uh, yeah, they can, you know, usually we get these kids um, referred to us to look for lish nodules to help with the diagnosis because they have a few cafe LA spots. Um, but usually we don't see these starting in kids until seven, eight, nine. So they. <laughs> you know, they'll send you 18 months old, all the, I get 18 months olds referred to me all the time to look for these, which they don't have, but doesn't mean that they won't get them later. They don't usually cause a vision problem. Those optic gliomas um, 
are pretty common in these kids. I just had a kid about a year ago that I did an ET, you know, I did a BMR on, I was kind of talking to the family and saying, well, it's always possible they could have a glioma that's causing this, but I don't think so. And we ended up getting an MRI and just showing thickening of one optic nerve. Maybe it's a glioma, maybe it's just thickening, hasn't changed at all. A lot of these don't change over time. When they do change, they can be pretty aggressive. I have had some gliomas that just push on the back of the eye and cause anisometropia. So any of these kids who have NF and come in with anisometropia, or if they have NF and they come in with any kind of strabismus, you have to kind of wonder a little bit more if they've got a glioma. Um, how do we follow these gliomas? They're kind of hard to follow. Um, you know, these kids, you can't really get visual fields on them. Uh, usually if they're rapidly progressive enough to drop their vision, you know, you, uh, we can follow that, that sometimes we will follow them with, uh, OCTs of the RNFL, um, in some of these kids where we, you know, are only following with MRI, so, you know, oftentimes they're young and can't come in and complete visual vision testing even. So sometimes they can be a little bit, uh, difficult to follow over time, but in general, the, most of the ones you see are non-progressive, but, um, and Dr. Young, how do you yeah. tell like a leash nodule, it, like a, basically a hamartoma, um, yeah. distinguishing yeah. it from just like an iris nevus or just like, you know, an eye syndrome? Um, Besides, I guess, the systemic This stuff. is way more common than ice. Um, uh, they're usually a little bit orangish. They usually have multiple. They're not just one, especially in an adult. Um, but I think sometimes they can be a little bit difficult to tell, especially when they're young and there's maybe only one or two in the eye. Um, uh, usually the kids I'm looking at with these are coming already with cafe au lait, so your uh, suspicion's high, but mm -hmm. distinguishing it from a Nevis, they're a little more orange color, I think, okay. not as dark. Um, and they're usually multiple. I, I, I mean, I haven't seen any ice since residency. Just don't see that in kids very often, but you know, adults with NF still have these. So yeah, it can be something you guys see too. When do we take out cataracts in kids? I think if unilateral four weeks and bilateral six. Close. So when I started training, I was more aggressive about taking these out. Now I watch some of them. Why? Because keeping that accommodation is, is, is nice and, and sometimes helps preserve their vision. Sometimes when you take these out and the people, if they're not going to patch, if they're not going to, especially the infants, uh, um, they're not going to patch. Sometimes it's where it's like, why did you take the cataract out to begin with? So certainly anything that's over three millimeters, you start to worry if they're two to three millimeters in, in the back of the lens, oftentimes I'll just follow them. And if people are good patching, they end up with good vision in the, in the eye. Um, but you really kind of want to balance a lot of the risks, minimize the risk of general anesthesia. Um, aphagic glaucoma is always something we worry about. So um, in terms of timing and kids who are born with one cataract in one eye, this big study suggests that we should, you know, take them out less than six weeks. So yeah, four to six weeks, like you said, Ariana, um, if you take them out after six weeks, um, their vision starts to drop um, precipitously, you know, so their visions can be pretty good before that time. If you take it out after it starts, you know. It, 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 after the six weeks time, their vision really starts to drop. So in general, we like taking them out about six weeks. Uh, the longer you wait from birth, probably the less likely they are to develop aphagic glaucoma. So we really like to kind of wait on that five, six week, um, five to six weeks uh, time frame. Um, they've done studies looking at kittens um, uh, that can also kind of help with how we understand binocular vision development um, in kids who um, where they sewed just one eye shut, um, all the neurons were driven by the non-deprived eye and this persisted when they opened the eyes for 14 months. Um, but in the kids who were, had both eyes uh, 
sewed shut, a third were binocular, a third were driven by one eye, and a third were unresponsive. And 14 months after, um, the number was the same. So, um, there, the the this is just kind of telling you that the window is a little bit longer for for binocularly deprived kittens and and adults too. Uh, and, sorry, and uh, humans as well. So we have a little bit more time uh, with kids who have bilateral uh, cataracts. And this is a, a big study done by um, Ed Wilson, which is where Leah trained, and Scott Lambert, who is now at Stanford. But he's kind of the one who has been doing a lot of these IAT studies. And they think that for these kids with bilateral cataracts, you can usually wait until about 10 weeks. And I really try to kind of wait until that time. Um, uh, because I think their their risk of glaucoma is less, and you just have a little, and I just think the longer you wait, the less risk of anesthesia and everything else like that. When do we leave the posterior capsule? If you can, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> or when they're old enough to be able to tolerate a YAG, I think, because PCO happens a lot, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, usually we usually like five five years I, I take it usually till about four or five years old uh, after that you can leave it and try to yag it later um, I've seen uh, Craig will sometimes leave these sooner or leave these earlier but I think in general in the peds world they, they almost always opacify so it's better to to take them right away um, uh, so surgery on these kids, their anterior lens capsule is more elastic. So for the really young kids, especially the ones less than a year, we just usually don't tear our rexus. We just use the um, cutter to, to make a vitrectorexis. Um, they have a really high rate of posterior capsule opacification. Usually I think people take the posterior capsule till about four or five years old. Um, uh, you also want to take some of that anterior vitreous because it can be a scaffold for uh, lens epithelial cells to regrow and regrow more membranes. Um, and you, you know, you want uh, to leave that posterior opening slightly smaller than the anterior capsular, capsular opening, but you kind of want to read them pretty big because a lot of these kids grow back, grow back membranes. <laughs> Afterwards, you know, um, we treat them with contact lenses. Those silicone lenses are really nice, although we've had a trouble lately because um, uh, <laughs> the, they couldn't get the stoppers for these new for these caps, and so from from supply chain issues, and so they applied to the FDA to get a new approval for a new a uh, way to deliver the a new way to sell these devices just in this bottle and it's taken like a year <laughs> so they haven't been making these contact lenses purely because the fda can't get back to them on whether to uh, approve this new kind of um, packaging um, so sometimes some people have been treating more with rigid gas permeables if they couldn't get these we're kind of getting more of them now again but um, we change them as the eye grows so we're over, we want to over plus these kids. So these contact lenses only come in certain powers. They start at 32 and then they jump in to 29, 26, 23, 20, and then they come in one diopters. So you just, you want to make sure that you give them more power to make them minus because you want to, what you want to do is put them in focus up close. So it's like looking through the bottom part of a bifocal. So if they're minus three, minus four, something like that, that's pretty great. If you leave this kid Plano, it's not great because they're not in focus up close. Um, uh, they can't focus anymore. They can't accommodate. Um, some of these kids though, even in a plus 32, they're still underdone. And if they're really young, you know, three, six months old, sometimes we'll just leave them that way and they should grow into it. But sometimes we have to put glasses on top of the contact lenses to get them clear enough at near for normal visual development. So um, the hard part of these kids is not taking the cataracts out because you know, uh, that's not the hard part. You just suck those cataracts out. They're not the most difficult cataracts to do, but the hard part is like following them after and figuring out what kind of contacts, what kind of glasses, and then when to put in IOLs. Um, the AFIC spectacles, you can have some induced ionized especially if the eyes are different. And, um, uh, you know, I prefer contact lenses because the optical center is better. You know, if you put these kids in, um, 
aphic spectacles, their clear optical zone is pretty small through the center of those glasses. And once they start looking off the center, um, it starts uh, degrading their image pretty quickly. So we like them in contact lenses, but sometimes that could be hard if they have a different prescription in each because they only come in three diopter jumps. These contacts are nice because I usually just have people leave them in for a week, even after surgery. I don't have them take them out for a month. Um, I think it's just better to have it in all the time than taking it out at night. They do get protein deposits on them. Um, Bausch and Lomb does not recommend you clean them with anything. Some people will clean them with the gas permeable solution cleaner, um, which can get some of those off, um, but they just start accumulating a lot of proteins on them. But I think it's better to have proteins and have them wear them all the time and have good prescription in there, you know, than have them taken them out all the time. Um, IOLs, yeah, usually, um, uh, ha you know, there are lots of issues in terms of uh, choosing powers and, and figuring out when to put them in. Does anyone have any idea how we do choose a power? There's a really simple way of thinking about it in that like your numbers should add up to eight in terms of like, if you're putting it in a two-year-old, um, you add their age with the power to be about eight. So a two-year-old you put in in like a plus six, a uh, four-year-old, um, you'd put in like a plus four, um, an eight-year-old you put in about a Plano. Uh, people do something kind of similar to that in general um, to, to put in those powers, but a lot of it is guessing. We don't know how these eyes are gonna grow. They're not usually normalized to begin with. So they just um, grow a little bit different. Um, I used to kind of wait longer on putting these lenses in with the Silsoft shortage. I've been putting more in now just after they're a year old. Kids who lose their contacts all the time after they're about a year, I'll put in the lens um, just to have them have some correction. Yeah, it's better to wait till longer because you have a better idea of what kind of lens to put in, but it's better to have them wear it some of the time than keep losing these contacts with then you have to order them in and takes a few weeks and then they've been a few weeks without a lens, which can cause permanent amblyopia. So. Um, uh, yeah, usually we use Hoffer cues because they're good for, you know, small eyes. Um, it's difficult to predict the growth. So yeah, some of these formulas aren't so good. I, I usually kind of look at the, at the eight and, um, some of these eyes tend to grow a lot. They've done recent, a recent study they haven't published yet with PDIG. They really kind of found out that these eyes kind of grew to whatever lens they had put in them as uh, too. So um, ended up a little bit better than they thought than they, uh, um, they might be. Um, when do we leave kids aphakic and when do we put in an IOL? Do you have any idea when we do put them in usually? Usually it's about a year. So this big IAT study, which Scott Lambert did, was a big randomized multi-center study. They looked at IOLs versus aphakia with a contact lens. Um, uh, yeah. So they did a little bit less in these little, little kids on target refraction, but somewhere between six and eight. Um, at a year, they found no significant difference in vision. But they did find that 63% versus 12% underwent an additional intraocular operation, meaning that the kids that they put an IOL in were much more likely to regrow a new membrane um, and versus the other kids. Um, so usually people wait about, do it about a year. They'll start putting contact lenses in, I don't know, nine months to a year. I think people are putting more contacts in and they're finding that some of these kids do better with contacts and I mean with uh, IOLs than they do um with um uh contacts especially especially looking at your patient population too if you feel like this family is going to have a hard time with contacts it's probably better when they're coming with cataract at nine months to to put in a um a lens um sorry so this is my niece who kind of got me into ophthalmology she had surgery by Dr. Hoffman when she was two weeks old and her irises are different colors. Do you guys know why that is? Could be that she got aphigate glaucoma and is on latanoprost. Yeah, that's a very good thought. 
it's very similar. So these kids almost all in unilateral cataracts. So she had cataract surgery in her right eye and that's the darker eye. They think it's because of, at the time of surgery that they release so many intraocular prostaglandins that their irises change color. So almost always in these kids with congenital cataracts, their irises are different colors before, I mean, are the same color before surgery and after surgery, the, surgery, the surgerized eye uh, turns a little bit darker. So um, kind of just an issue, but it probably is, yeah, same mechanism, prostaglandin, but she also could be on, have a fake glaucoma, exactly, but almost all kids with cataracts, infantile cataracts, have either two eyes that are kind of that color, that greenish, brownish color, or the eye that's operated on is that, is, is a little bit darker. Gonna go briefly through congenital glaucoma. I don't know how much Craig covers, but um, uh, usually seen in the first year of life, um, can be familial. Um, symptoms we commonly think of tearing, photophobia, blinking, eye rubbing. Um, usually these kids come in with uh, um, cloudy corneas, high intraocular pressure. Unlike um, other glaucomas, adult glaucomas, where it's always like, what's what pressure is good for this patient? In when we're talking congenital glaucoma, we're always talking high pressures. We're not ever talking normal pressures. Uh, glaucoma. We're just talking that they either uh, that they can't drain the fluid that they've got, building up, building up higher pressures. Um, can be associated with, you know, like we said, aniridia. Kids who have ROP and treated with laser are more likely. It can be associated with, you know, anterior segment disorders. Um, can be associated with lots of other syndromes. Um, Lowe's is the big one, which is we see in boys with um, uh, alter, you know, a little bit of mental delay. We certainly see a lot of Sturge Weber kids. Um, and, you know, we just follow them over time because their glaucoma can come up later. Isn't always present right when we diagnose it. Um, we're diagnosing this, yes, we're just looking for a high pressure. Um, their gonioscopy can be a little bit uh, difficult to um, assess because they can have these membranes covering their trabecular meshwork. Um, big thing is you want to look at their refraction and treat any associated amblyopia. Usually they come in with cl you know, cloudy corneas like this. Um, oftentimes can't get a view of their angle or anything, even under anesthesia. Um, often have to put them on... Uh, drops or um, diamox, um, just wanna watch for associated um, uh, uh, electrolyte imbalances that can come with those. Also topical bladel blockers are good. In general, in kids, we like to avoid any alpha-2 agonists. They can have some CNS depression, can have some changes in behavior and things. Um, I see this pretty commonly in kids, you know, you know, the few we've tried on it. Who, because they have congenital glaucoma that have failed other therapies, and then we try them on this. It seems pretty common that they have they have issues with the alpha two agonists. I don't have any kids who have been able to tolerate it. Um, we treat these with either a goniotomy, which requires a clear cornea where they be incised through the trabecular meshwork under direct visualization, it means you have to have a clear cornea. So you you know either have to often have to have them on Diamox for a little while to let those corneas clear. Um, can also, you know, treat them with a tra trabecula trabeculotomy where, you know, you can feed this device through, um, through Schlem's canal and then kind of tear it inwards. Afterwards, they develop a hyphema, um, but just to try to open, open that, um, drainage up. You can also, you know, we do these, use these trabectomes or thing, or, or sorry, this trabectome, but they use these uh, catheters that often have a blinking light on the end and thread them around and, and pull it through. Um, this is one that, one of those. Um, if angle surgery fails, sometimes they can have a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, um, later can put in tube shunts. Um, can do some ciliary body destructive procedures so they just don't make as much um, uh, aqueous fluid. Um, other treatment concerns with these kids, amblyopia, we want to make sure we, you know, treat their refractive. This kid obviously has buphthalmus, so they're going to have a pretty big prescription difference between those two eyes, strabismus. Sometimes they'll just take out the eye if the 
disfiguring buthalmus is too much and they have really poor vision prognosis. Um, what do you think the most common glaucoma I see in my practice is? I don't like managing glaucoma, but I have a fair amount of them. A fake ick? Yeah, most of the ones are the ones I cause. So a fake ick. So um, aphagic glaucoma is really common um, and it, the numbers of incidents kind of go up the longer you follow these kids. So um, this is a study that looked at, you know, 30 years of uh, kids in a big glaucoma practice in Boston um, and found that 60% developed glaucoma, pretty dang high. Um, uh, you know, 33 months up to 29 years. So many years later, they can still develop it. Risk factors for glaucoma are, are age. And, it, you know, especially if they were operating less than a month, it's much more likely to cause glaucoma. You know, kids with complications are more likely to have it. This, you know, post-operative is cyclopedic use. But we like that because otherwise they are more likely to develop membranes and things. So, um, you know, you're kind of balancing things here. This may just be because we put all kids on that, any, all little kids on that anyway. So um, maybe a little bit hard to tease that out. Early surgery is, uh, yeah, um, this is, you know, another study looking at 80 patients and the risk of glaucoma at five years and one eye in patients who underwent surgery was 50%. So risk of aphagic glaucoma is really high. Um, and so, you know, I take out a fair amount of cataracts for kids um, and just follow them over time. Um, and getting IOP measurements is not always possible on some of these kids. So there's other things you have to watch as well. And one of the big ones is refractive error. Um, uh, just if that's changing rapidly, you know, even in the little bit older kids, sometimes their refractive error, even though you think about the buphthalmus only in the little, little kids, I, I do think their refractive error can change when they're having, and I'll, I'll show you a case of that in a minute here. Um, you also can look at their corminal diameter and clarity, their AC. I have one kid that their AC, you know, really kind of just collapsed. Um, they started growing more uh, uh, peripheral, you know, synechia. Um, and, and then you can also kind of look at their cup to disc ratio. So IOP measurements, the big one, but sometimes that's not always possible in kids. And sometimes you don't want to put them under anesthesia just to measure that pressure. Uh, so you can look at other things as well. So this is kind of an interesting case I had of a kid who came to see me. I, their big complaint was just that little bit of ptosis in the right eye, which is kind of a little bit hard to see. Um, but she came in to see me when she was 10 months old. Um, and it looks like she has a bigger pupil on that eye, but uh, we'll take a little closer look at that in a minute. She had, you know, pretty normal refraction, just a mild ptosis. She didn't seem to have any amblyopia at the time in a normal dilated exam. If you looked a little bit closer, you could see that she had this, you know, con congenital ectropia and uvea. But it didn't seem to be causing a problem. I thought it was kind of interesting that it was also in the eye with the ptosis, but just kind of watched her. Two years later, she came back to me and we checked her pressure and it was 37 in that right eye. Um, uh, what else would you want to be looking at to kind of confirm that that really is a real pressure? Corneal thickness. Yeah, that's a good one. What else on exam would you see that would tell you that maybe this kid had glaucoma? The nerve. Yeah, the nerve. So um, she had a, she had started to cup that eye. She now had like a 0.6 in that eye. And um, uh, she came back a few months later. Um, and I sent her to Craig. She had been on drops for a few months failed the drops, he ended up doing a trabeculectomy. And then she came back after that to see me and now had, um, and I dilated her at this point. I didn't dilate her the time before because her pressure was high and I knew I was sending her to Craig anyway. And she now has this anisometropia. So she's a little bit older. She was like three years old now at this point. And, you know, so she had had some anisometropia developed from, those, from that higher pressure. I mean, it's also confounded a little bit by the fact that she had had surgery as well. But um, so she came in with this prescription. What kind, of a, what kind of a prescription would you give in this kiddo? What glasses would you write in this kiddo with that prescription?
What things do you think about when you're writing a prescription? If you're going to give the full power and then also uh, bifocals, uh, isn't that kind of, yeah, because she had cataract surgery. She didn't, they just did a trabeck. They oh. just did, um, no, they did not do uh, cataract surgery. They just did glaucoma surgery. So she doesn't need any of that. But yeah, you want to know if you want to give the full prescription. When are you more likely to uh, give the full prescription? If they have any kind of deviation. Correct. And if they're younger. So the younger kids will tolerate more plus. Older kids won't. So she may not. I would cut, I'd cut probably one off and give her, but then you have to cut it off both. So if you're cutting one off just to make the glasses a little bit um, more uh um acceptable i'd probably just give her a 50 in the left eye and then a minus 350 in the right some people don't like doing so much minus and she's only two years old so she will probably accept it but you always want to think about giving the full plus in any in any kid without any kind of deviation because they're used to accommodating that and they may not like it so this was kind of something i didn't know about with this kiddo but they can with this congenital atropian uvi they often um uh, can get this glaucoma that's really difficult to treat. It can be associated with these other syndromes as well. And it's also associated with ipsilateral ptosis because their Mueller muscles from the neural crest too. So they've got some kind of abnormality there. Um, usually seen in teenagers, but anyone with ectro... And then I, I saw another kid with this after I'd seen this one who came in with a pressure in the 30s too. So some of these ectropia and UVIs, you just need to follow their pressure and, and make sure... I mean, you can certainly get this from trauma as well, but these kids, you know, which is a different entity, but um, uh, certainly these kids who have congenital unilateral ectropia and uvi, you just got to follow them for glaucoma. What would you be worried about in this patient? What do they have on their iris margin there? Those are cysts, so iris cysts. Anyone know what you worry about in kids with lots of iris cysts? <coughs> the bad thing is it can be associated with mutations that also cause um, thoracic aortic aneurysm. <coughs> so you always kind of have to worry about that. Iris sphincter muscles are smooth muscles like the aorta. And, and uh, so kids with lots of those, you kind of worry about that. Um, usually when I see kids with cysts, they're just pigment epithelial cysts, don't cause vision problems, don't require treatment. Sometimes they go away pretty quickly. I had one kid that one of you guys called me to the, or I was in clinic and had me look at somebody with a bunch of those. Um, right after birth and uh, like a ton, like all around the margin edges. And I saw the kid back in one month and they were completely gone. So they can go away. Sometimes they can have some associated medriasis and apparent accommodation. I haven't seen that too often, but you see lots of kids, the pediatrician will often pick up on it because when they see the red reflex, they'll see some little bubbles on the side there, but usually they don't cause problems. Um, they're just the pigment epithelial. The ones that do cause problems are the ones in the stroma, um, but those are pretty rare. I've never seen any. Why might you get consulted on a kid with allergial? I've gotten a fair amount of these lately. They're diagnosing this. Do you know what, who, does anyone know what allergials is? The bile duct problem where they don't have enough bile ducts and then they go into liver failure. But these kids have posterior embryo toxin. They also have this characteristic period with a pointed chin there. Um, but 15% of people also have just a, you know, one of those posterior embryo toxins. So I have a fair amount of these kids that are all sent to me. I have yet to see a glaucoma, but they like to send them this way these days. Um, and that's about it. Um, the the long-term follow-up required for all these disorders, the big thing is looking for refraction, refractive errors, you know, looking for uh, deprivation problems and things we need to treat uh, their amblyopia. 
diagnosing glaucoma, which sometimes doesn't happen right away, especially in these AFAKs, you know, years and years later, they can, you know, also in Sturge Weber and things, they can develop glaucoma later. Getting these kids hooked up with vision services at school is really one of the big things I do, especially for like these albino kids, um, just making sure they're getting help at school because um, most of them adapt pretty well, but can have pretty poor vision. Any questions? Thank right. you. You're welcome. We'll see you later. Thanks again.